Okay, so uh, so the outline. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you today about prognostication and navigation of uh, treatment options in CLL, mainly the frontline treatment. Uh, the outline of my talk will be staging and prognosis of CLL, frontline treatment options, as well as we'll go over some scenario. <coughs> so I will start by a quiz. Who knows this this professor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kanti Rai, I mean the one who uh, developed uh, Rai uh, staging. <coughs> so uh, when we talk about uh, staging of CLL, so we do have a two famous. One is Rai staging, uh, which is more ad more adopted by the American hospitals, and Binet st staging, which is adopted more by the European. Uh, Binet is a French physician. Yeah. <coughs> So just what I, what I just want to focus to highlight here is that uh, CLL is not an indolent disease. CLL is a heterogeneous disease. Uh, uh, the median survival varies a lot uh, between those with a low, low, low risk score uh, versus those with a high risk score. And uh, uh, the survival varies between more than 10 years uh, down to around one or two years uh, for those with a high risk uh, disease. Another important point <coughs> is the hemoglobin cutoff. In uh, uh, rice stage, it, uh, it, uh, they are using uh, 11, while in Pinay, they are using 10 gram per deciliter. So <coughs> probably as uh, you all know, that not, not all patients with CLA require immediate treatment. Uh, uh, Ray stage uh, zero, uh, PNA stage uh, A, they don't need a treatment. Those with advanced disease <coughs> without st stage 3, 4, or PNA stage 3, they do require treatment. Those in the middle, I mean, uh, you have to do some uh, customization. <coughs> so prognosis. <coughs> there, are <coughs> there are many uh, markers uh, to look at the prognosis of CLL. Um, uh, the staging is one of them. Uh, the pattern of the inf uh, of lymphocyte infiltration in the bone marrow is another one. Lymphocyte doubling time, CD38, uh, Ig, uh, IgHV, uh, ZAP70, cytogenetic is another uh, important markers. Uh, and don't forget the P53. So uh, P53 uh, uh, operation is an important uh, predictor uh, for the outcome. <coughs> so uh, mutation, uh, so remember that not all patients with, uh, uh, with, del with deletion, with not all the patients with deletion 17, they do have P53 and the other way around. So this is an, uh, uh, an excellent study that looked at the correlation between deletion 17 and P53, and there is around 22% uh, with P53 mutation. W however, they don't have deletion 17. So, <coughs> so if we look at the response to uh, treatment when P53, a protein up uh, does improve actually the, 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 the survival uh, significantly whether it is a, a progression-free survival or overall survival for, for those with P53 uh, mutation. When we have a very bad prognostic marker like P53, uh, um, almost all the recommendation is to avoid chemoimmunotherapy and to, uh, to put the patient in upfront targeted immunotherapy. IgHV, which is immunoglobin heavy chain, is a very old test that was reported first time in 1990. Uh, if it's unmutated, this is very bad prognostic uh, marker. Uh, if it's mutated, actually, the outcome is, uh, is good. <coughs> IgHV can predict uh, the clinical course of the patient, uh, as well as uh, the correlation with other markers like uh, deletion 17. So uh, if you see that <coughs> those with mutated Ig uh, HV, which is a blue line, uh, versus the IgHV with uh, deletion 17, versus those only with high, uh, with high risk who are deletion 17. So the outcome of deletion 17 here is the most 
worse outcome. So, uh, how to test for IGHV? It's, uh, it's a molecular analysis uh, by immunoglobulin gene sequencing. Uh, this test is, is very well standardized by European Research Institute for CLL. Uh, it has to be tested at least once. And remember, uh, IGHV mutation does happen in around 50% of the patients. IGHV does, does impact uh, uh, the outcome of the patient. And other important marker is uh, this is a B2, uh, beta 2 microglobulin. So beta 2 is an important uh, marker to predict the CLL outcome, which is, uh, which is not very frequently used. Uh, actually, also beta, beta 2 microglobulin can help predicting the response to a protein. So <coughs> what test we need uh, before starting the patient in the treatment? So there are tests that has to be done, and there are tests that, that are optional, and there are tests that usually are done in clinical trials. So cytogenetics uh, for deletion 13, 11, uh, 11 Q, 17 P, uh, addition 12 are important, and doing it through the peripheral blood is more than enough. Another, another important, uh, uh, so, sorry about that. So uh, FISH from peripheral blood is an important test that has to, uh, has to be done always. Uh, P53 test is also another important test. IGHV mutation is, o is also uh, an essential that as, as per IWCLL. Do you, do you have to do bone marrow at the time of diagnosis? Uh, the answer is no. Do you have to do CT? Uh, the answer is no unless it's part of clinical trial. So IGHV as well as the cyto cytogenetic by FISH are important tests that has to be done. So switching to the second part, which is a frontline treatment option. So uh, what is the goal of therapy in CLL? So achieving cure in CLL is a very difficult uh, task, especially with the chemoimmunotherapy. However, now with the targeted therapy, this might change. Uh, however, we need more studies to assess the, the avail uh, the possibility of achieving cure, uh, which means that negative MRD. Usually the goal of treatment in C for CLL is to elevate symptoms, reverse cytopenia, improve quality of life, and prolong overall survival. Uh, se several studies, especially the old ones, that uh, reported the median overall survival of approximately between 5 to 15 years uh, for the patient after starting the first line treatment. So before starting treatment, there are some important questions that we have to answer. So number one, is, is the disease active uh, or not? Second is uh, medical fitness. Uh, how to assess the activity of the disease is as per IWCLL. <coughs> uh, usually uh, these are very well known. Uh, you have, uh, number one is you have the evidence of uh, uh, progressive bone marrow uh, manifestation, whether it's an anemia or thrombocytopenia. You have a massive splenomegaly, uh, massive lymph lymphadenopathies, uh, lymphocyte doubling time. Uh, autoimmune uh, manifestation of CL is another important uh, indicator. Uh, constitutional symptoms with a weight loss, severe fatigability. Some patients might require treatment only because of severe fatigability, uh, uh, fever and night sweat. How to assess medical fitness? There are uh, different ways in assessing medical fitness. Number one is, which is very famous, is performance status, which is ACOG. However, uh, this is not enough. I mean, although it is uh, frequently used by us, uh, if you review literature, especially in older adults, uh, uh, ACOG is not the best way to assess uh, medical fitness. Uh, you have to look at the comorbidities, and there are two famous, which is Charlson Community Index, CTCI, although it is for trans in initially proposed for a transplant, but uh, it has been used even outside the transplant. Uh, geriatric assessment, this is a very important way to assess patients, uh, 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 older adult patients, uh, and we'll go over some of it, some of the tools that use for geriatric assessment. So if you look at the geriatric uh, medical fitness assessment, the aim is to assess treatment tolerance, uh, which links to their physical function, uh, cognitive function, uh, nutrition, uh, social support, comorbidities, psychosocial health. <coughs> so, uh, 
So uh, physical, uh, physical assessment can be done by ECOG. However, ECO, ECOG lacks sensitivity, identifying impairment uh, in older adults. Other important tool is ADL, which is activity of daily living. Uh, it is by assessing the self-feeding, dressing content, grooming, transferring, using the bathroom. Uh, uh, IADL, instrument activity of daily living, is another way. Uh, and one of the most important uh, tool is short physical performance battery. Uh, again, uh, ECOG is unable to differentiate uh, uh, patients with subclinical vulnerability from those who are fit. So uh, there is a video, but because of the uh, time, I will not run it. But there, are, there is an eight-minute video uh, show you how can you do the uh, SPPP uh, in, in eight minutes. So it, you didn't need a geriatrician, although it is preferred. Uh, you can do it yourself if, if you have some shortage of resources. There is also an application uh, looking at uh, it helps you to, it helps you in doing the SPP. <coughs> SPP consists from lower extremity strength, chair standing, gait speed. It takes around eight to 10 minutes uh, to be done. Uh, and then uh, after doing the test, I mean, patient will be categorized uh, into either severe limitation, moderate, mild, or minimal, uh, 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 minimal uh, uh, reduction of the test. Uh, another important tool, so the first one was for physical uh, assessment. The second one for older adult is a cognitive function. Uh, the most famous one is a 3MS, which is a mini mental state examination. Uh, it's a validated screening tool to assess global cognition. Uh, the score is between 0 to 100. If it's less than 77, this, uh, then there is an impairment. Uh, 3MS, as well as SPPB, are important predictive variables for outcome in older patients. It's not, not only in CLL, but also across other uh, malignancy, uh, including hematological malignancies. So, uh, so if you answer the two, two, two first questions, which are that indication for treatment as well as the fitness, then we'll, you have to go over the treatment options. So if you have a, uh, if you have a patient who is, uh, so this is NCCN uh, 2020 guidelines. So if you have a patient who is less than 65 without significant comorbidities, so the first, uh, uh, first preferred regimen is targeted therapy, whether it is a ibrutinib uh, or vetoclax. Other uh, chemoimmunotherapy are still uh, considered as an other recommendation, which include uh, bendamustine rituximab, FCR, uh, FR. Okay. So uh, if you look at the CLL10, uh, so it, it did compare FCR, uh, which used, used to be standard of care in young fit uh, versus uh, bendamustine rituximab. So the, the blue line is for the FCR, the green is for bendamustine rituximab. It did show that uh, uh, P, uh, advantage of uh, progression, uh, progression free survival advantage of using FCR. PR has been reported to have lower toxicity in comparison to FCR. Uh, if you look at the GC, uh, GCLL SG trial, <coughs> also it did show that FCR is better than FC, whether it's an overall survival or PFS. Uh, switching to uh, ECOG uh, 1912, which, which compared uh, ibrutinib rituximab versus uh, FCR in younger patients with previously untreated uh, CLL. So the eligibility was uh, an age less than 70, uh, treatment naive. Uh, in this study, it's important to highlight that deletion 17P patients were excluded. Uh, patients were randomized into two arms. So the first arm received a protein in cycle one, which was a uh, full dose, which is 420. And then the rituximab was added in the subsequent uh, cycles. Uh, the, other, uh, the other arm, which is the FCR, the standard FCR up to six cycles. <coughs> Primary endpoint was PFS. Secondary endpoint was overall survival. And this was done using intention to treat. So uh, a protein rituximab did show actually uh, advantage in, uh, at both PFS and OS in comparison to F FCR. Number of events uh, in the uh, protein arm was 37 out of 354 versus 40 out of 
So this is a, uh, the, uh, the curve. And if we look at the PFS, it was 89 uh, uh, versus 72 uh, using FCR. And if, uh, overall survival, that there was, there was slightly uh, advantage. However, it was statistically not uh, significant. If you look at the advantage, uh, the PFS advantage of hibrotinib, it was across the board for all type of diseases, uh, age, uh, staging, uh, IGHB mutation. So if you look at the specific at IGHV, so uh, for patient with unmutated IGHV, which is considered to be a bad prognostic marker, uh, the PFS here was 90% versus 62 for those who received uh, FCR. If you look at the uh, mutated IGHV, uh, actually uh, the difference here was not statistically uh, significant. So this is a response rate. Uh, so this is very interesting, actually. Uh, so in that uh, study, uh, we found that uh, the overall response rate of using a protocol was 95% versus 80% of FCR. However, uh, the rate of achieving CR or CRI was higher in FCR, was 30% versus 17.2. Why is that? Really, we don't know as of now. Uh, if you look at the safety of, uh, of using uh, ibrutinib uh, versus FCR, uh, overall it was uh, safer with less, with less toxicity. Grade 3 to 4 uh, adverse event were 58 versus 72. Neutropenia was 23 versus 44. And the risk of infection was 7% versus 17%. <coughs> Just want to highlight a few important adverse events of ibrutinib. Uh, which were higher than uh, FCR. Uh, so you have atrial fibrillation, okay, is an important hypertension and bleeding. These are important side effects that uh, although the incidence is, is low, however, it's important to, to pay attention to them. Hypertension occurred in 18% uh, uh, as a grade three, and atrial fibrillation happened in 2.6% as grade uh, three. So uh, <coughs> on that study, the authors concluded that combination of a protein and metrosomal provides superior PFS and OS uh, relative to FCR for patients with previously untreated CLL age uh, less, less or equal 70 years old. Another quiz. I'm pretty simple uh, or very famous people. Yeah, this is Vinay. Yeah. So there's been a. Uh, <coughs> so uh, moving uh, forward to the second uh, type of the patient, who, uh, which include the frail patient or those who are above 65 years uh, old. So uh, the preferred regimen, again, is targeted therapy, whether it is a protein up uh, or ventoclax if, uh, up. Other recommendations include uh, uh, BR, chlorambicil, uh, abitizumab, uh, rituximab alone. So, uh, so this is a uh, phase three uh, prospective randomized study, uh, which is CLL11. Uh, so they looked at uh, uh, progression-free survival as well uh, in combat between rituximab, chlorambicil versus abitizumab, chlorambicil. And epitizumab chlorambicil was superior than rituximab chlorambicil when it comes to PFS. However, in OS, it was, uh, it was statistically not significant. Uh, Regine, uh, two study, uh, it, it did look at uh, ibrutinib versus chlorambicil in uh, treatment naive CLL uh, with a median follow-up of 60 months. Uh, 58 patients remain on the therapy, and it did show that ibrutinib uh, Progression-free survival for, uh, for patients who were on protein was 17%, uh, 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 while the OS was 83 versus 68, and 57 patients were crossed from chlorambicil to ibrutinib uh, after disease progression. And the benefit was across the, across the board for all uh, genomic subgroups. 
So this is a curve of a PFS. And uh, as I mentioned, that it was across a board for deletion 11, uh, IgHV mutated and unmutated. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the safety of uh, ibrutinib in, in older adult, uh, rate of adverse event were less with the time. Discontinuation due to adverse event happened only in 7% uh, in the first year, 6% in the second year. Uh, so it was very relatively small percentage. And the side effects were also similar to those who, uh, who are fit. Uh, again, I emphasize them to hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and uh, major hemorrhage. So uh, switching to Alliance uh, 041202, which look at ibrutinib uh, plus myocerotiximab uh, versus bindamustine in naive uh, CLL patients. Uh, so uh, the inclusion criteria were uh, patient w uh, who is above age of 65, and then the patient were, were randomized into three arms. Uh, the first arm received bindamustine rituximab. The bindamustine dose was 90 milligram. Uh, the second arm, ibrutinib alone at 420 milligram. Uh, the third arm was ibrutinib plus rituximab. <coughs> and they looked at uh, progression-free survival. Uh, So, uh, so if you look at the progression-free survival, uh, so the blues uh, are for uh, protein up uh, alone or protein up plus uh, rituximab, while the, the black line is with the mustin rituximab. So there is very clear uh, advantage uh, of using uh, a protein up uh, in comparison to PR as a, uh, a progression-free survival. However, the addition of rituximab did not improve the PFS. If you look at the overall survival, actually it was not statically significant. Uh, again, looking at the, uh, the adverse event, uh, so, so all hematological uh, side effects, which is grade three and above, it did happen in 60% 60 per, 60 of uh, patients who received BR versus uh, 40 to 38 for those with ibrutinib plus minus rituximab. Uh, Non-hematological toxicity, which include bleeding, it did happen only on, uh, on, on two percent in a uh, protein of arm versus nil and BR. Uh, infection was twenty percent. Fibrinotropenia was lower in, in the protein of arm, which was two percent. Charleston community index CTCI, although it is for trans initially proposed for a transplant, but uh, it has been used even outside the transplant. Uh, geriatric assessment. This is very important way to assess patient. Uh, uh, older adult patients, and we'll go over some of it, some of the tools that use for geriatric assessment. So if you look at the geriatric uh, medical fitness assessment, the aim is to assess treatment tolerance, uh, which linked to their physical function, uh, cognitive function, uh, nutrition, uh, social support, comorbidities, psychosocial health. <coughs> So uh, physical, uh, physical assessment can be done by ECOG. However, ECO, ECOG lacks sensitivity, identifying impairment uh, in older adult. Other important tool is ADL, which is activity of daily living. Uh, it is by assessing the self-feeding, dressing content, grooming, transferring, using the bathroom. Uh, uh, IADL, instrument activity of daily living, is another way. Uh, and one of the most important uh, tool is short physical performance battery. Uh, again, uh, ECOG is unable to differentiate uh, uh, patients with subclinical vulnerability from those who are fit. So uh, there is a video, but because of the uh, time, I will not run it, but there, are, there is an eight minute video uh, show you how can you do the uh, SPPP uh, in, in eight minutes. So it, you didn't need a geriat geriatrician, although it is preferred. Uh, you can do it yourself if, if you have some shortage of resources. There is also an application uh, looking at, uh, it, helps you to, it helps you in doing the SPP. <coughs> SPP consists from lower extremity strength, chair standing, gait speed. It takes around eight to 10 minutes uh, to be done. Uh, and then uh, after doing the test, I mean patient will be categorized uh, into either severe limitation, moderate, mild, or minimal, uh, 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 minimal, uh, uh, reduction of the test. Uh, another important tool, so the first one was for physical 
uh, assessment. The second one for older adults is a cognitive function. Uh, the most famous one is a 3MS, which is a mini mental state examination. Uh, it's a validated screening tool to assess global cognition. Uh, the score is between 0 to 100. If it's less than 77, this, the, then there is an impairment. Uh, 3MS, as well as SPPB, are important predictive variables for outcome in older patients. It's not, not only in CLL, but also across other uh, malignancy, uh, including hematological malignancies. So, uh, so if you answer the two, two, two first questions, which are that indication for treatment as well as the fitness, then we'll, you have to go over the treatment options. So if you have a, uh, if you have a patient who is, uh, so this is NCCN uh, 2020 guidelines. So if you have a patient who is less than 65 without significant comorbidities, so the first, uh, uh, first preferred regimen is targeted therapy, whether it is a brotinib uh, or vetoclax. Other uh, chemoimmune therapy are still uh, considered as an other recommendation, which include uh, bendamustine rituximab, FCR, uh, FR. Okay. So uh, if you look at the CLL10, uh, so it, it did compare FCR, uh, which used, used to be standard of care in young fit uh, versus uh, bendamustine rituximab. So the, the blue line is for the FCR, the green is for bendamustine rituximab. It did show that uh, uh, P, uh, advantage of uh, progression, uh, progression free survival advantage using FCR. PR has been reported to have lower toxicity in comparison to FCR. Uh, if you look at the GC, uh, GCLL SG trial, <coughs> also it did show that FCR is better than FC, whether it's an overall survival or PFS. Uh, switching to uh, ECOG uh, 1912, which, which compared uh, a protein and protoximab versus uh, FCR in younger patients with previously untreated uh, CLL. So the eligibility was uh, an age less than 70, uh, treatment naive. Uh, in this study, it's important to highlight that deletion 17P patients were excluded. Uh, patients were randomized into two arms. So the first arm received a protein in cycle one, which was uh, full dose, which is 420. And then the rituximab was added in the subsequent uh, cycles. Uh, the, other, the other arm, which is the FCR, the standard FCR, up to six cycles. <coughs> Primary endpoint was PFS. Secondary endpoint was overall survival. Analysis was done using intention to treat. So uh, a protein rituximab did show actually uh, advantage in, uh, at both PFS and OS in comparison to F FCR. Number of events uh, in the, uh, the protein of R was 37 out of 354 versus 40 out of 175. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the, uh, the care. And if you look at the PFS, it was 89 uh, uh, versus 72 uh, using FCR. And if uh, overall survival, that there was, there was slightly uh, advantage. However, it was statistically not uh, significant. If you look at the advantage, uh, the BFS advantage of hybrotinib, it was across the board for all type of diseases, uh, age, uh, staging, uh, IGHB mutation. So if you look at the specific at IGHB, so uh, for patients with unmutated IgHV, which is considered to be a bad prognostic marker, uh, the PFS here was 90% versus 62 for those who received uh, FCR. If you look at the uh, mutated IgHV, uh, actually uh, the difference here was not statistically uh, significant. So this is a response rate. Uh, so this is very interesting, actually. Uh, so in that uh, study, uh, we found that uh, the overall response rate of using a protein map was 95% versus 80% of FCR. However, uh, the rate of achieving CR or CRI was higher in FCR, was 30% versus 17.2. Why is that? Really, we don't know as of now. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at the safety of, uh, of using uh, ibrutinib uh, versus FCR, uh, overall it was uh, safer with less, with less toxicity. Grade three to four uh, adverse events were 58 versus 72. Neutropenia was 23 versus 44. And the risk of infection was 7% versus 17%. Just want to highlight a few important adverse events of ibrutinib, uh, which were higher than uh, FCR. Uh, so you have atrial fibrillation, okay, is an important hypertension and bleeding. These are important side effects that, uh, although the incidence is is low, however, it's important to to pay attention to them. Hypertension occurred in 18 uh, percent uh, as a grade three, and atrial fibrillation happened in 2.6 percent as grade uh, three. So, uh, <coughs> on that study, the authors concluded that the combination of a protein and bandrosuximab provides superior PFS and OS uh, relative to FCR for patients with previously untreated CLL age uh, less, less or equal 70 years old. Another quiz. I'm pretty simple, uh, or very famous people. Yeah, this is Vinay. Yeah. So there's been a. Uh, <coughs> so uh, moving uh, forward to the second uh, type of the patient, who, uh, which include the frail patient or those who are above 65 years uh, old. So uh, the preferred regimen, again, is targeted therapy, whether it is a protein up uh, or ventoclax aprotizumab. Uh, Other recommendations include uh, uh, BR, chlorambicil, uh, Abitizumab, uh, rituximab alone. So, uh, so this is a f uh, phase three uh, prospective randomized study, uh, which is CLL11. Uh, so they looked at uh, uh, progression-free survival, as well uh, in combat between rituximab, chlorambicil versus abitizumab, chlorambicil. And abitizumab, chlorambicil was superior than rituximab, chlorambicil when it comes to PFS. However, in OS. It was, uh, it was statistically not significant. Uh, Regine, uh, two study, uh, it, it did look at uh, abrotinib versus chlorambicil in uh, treatment naive CLL uh, with a median follow up of 60 months. Uh, 58 patients remain on the therapy, and it did show that abrotinib, uh, progression free survival for, uh, for patients who were on abrotinib was 70%. Uh, 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 while the OS was 83 versus 68, and 57 patients were crossed from chlorambicil to abrotinib uh, after disease progression. And the benefit was across the, across the board for all uh, genomic subgroups. So this is a care of a PFS. And uh, as I mentioned, that it was across the board for deletion 11, uh, IgHV mutated and unmutated. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the safety of uh, ibrutinib in, in older adult, uh, rate of adverse event were less with the time. Discontinuation due to adverse event happened only in 7% uh, in the first year, 6% in the second year. Uh, so it was very relatively small percentage. And the side effects were also similar to those who, uh, who are fit. Uh, again, I emphasize on to hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and uh, major hemorrhage. So uh, switching to Alliance uh, 041202, which looked at ibrutinib uh, plus minus rituximab uh, versus bindamustine in naive uh, CLL patients. Uh, so uh, the inclusion criteria were uh, patient w uh, who is above age of 65, and then the patient were, were randomized into three arms. Uh, the first arm received bendamustine rituximab. The bendamustine dose was 90 milligram. Uh, the second arm, ibrutinib alone at 420 milligram. Uh, the third arm was ibrutinib plus rituximab. <coughs> and they looked at uh, progression-free survival. Okay, uh, so, uh, so if you look at the progression-free survival, uh, so the blues uh, are for uh, protein up uh, alone or protein up plus uh, rituximab, while the 
the black line is beta mustin rituximab. So there is very clear uh, advantage uh, of using uh, ibrutinib uh, in comparison to PR as a, uh, as a progression-free survivor. However, the addition of rituximab did not improve the PFS. If you look at the overall survival, actually it was not statically significant. Uh, again, looking at the, uh, the adverse event, uh, so, so all hematological uh, side effects, which is grade three and above, it did happen in 60% 60 per, 60 of uh, patients who received BR versus uh, 40 to 38 for those with ibrutinib plus minus rituximab. Uh, Non-hematological toxicity, which include bleeding, it did happen only on, uh, on, on 2% uh, uh, in the protein of arm versus nil and BR. Uh, infection was 20%. Fibrinal neutropenia was lower in, in the protein of arm, which was 2% versus 7 uh, Atrial fibrillation, 9% uh, versus 3% uh, in the BR. Hypertension was 29% versus 14 in the BR. <coughs> So, uh, so in this study, uh, the authors concluded that uh, in this inter international uh, prospective randomized phase three trial, it did show uh, protein produced superior PFS to, to a standard uh, treatment in older patients with CL and justify it as a new standard of care uh, for patients who are above 65 and older. The addition of rituximab uh, did not prolong PFS uh, with protein. This will be my last quiz, I think. So this is uh, Professor Richter. He's a pathologist who, who is the first one who described Richter transformation. So uh, looking at Illuminate study, which is uh, a protein plus uh, operatism versus chromosomes, so a protein is first line. So patient where. Uh, so there were 229 patients previously untreated CLL uh, above age 65 or less than that with comorbidities. Uh, patient uh, <coughs> patient received operatism uh, is 420 milligram plus operatism 1000 versus chlorambicil. And again, is, uh, operatinib is uh, showed superior PFS. The question is, how about the comparison arm? Is it, is it the ideal uh, comparison arm to say? Uh, um, maybe it is, a, it is a relatively weak. Uh, Clarambicil is not frequently used nowadays, except by maybe some physicians. Uh, overall survival was the same. So this is a very important point that, uh, I mean, addition of a protein, uh, I mean, giving a protein of protozoomab did not uh, lead to survival advantage. So Britain is very uh, relatively an old medication. It has been used now for more than seven years uh, with very uh, <coughs> good profile in the side effects. So I'm going to switch to the new agent uh, uh, that came to the market in the last years, which is uh, Vitoclax. And it is a very promising drug. Uh, Vitoclax in, uh, with immunotism was, uh, st uh, was tested in CLL14 study, uh, and it did also show some uh, BFS advantage in comparison to chlorambicil ibnatazib. Uh, <coughs> uh, BFS at 24 months was significantly higher in, in this arm in comparison to chlorambicil ibnatazib. It was 80 88 versus 64 uh, percent. All cause mortality uh, was 9 percent in Vitoclax arm uh, versus 7.9, which, which, uh, which is not statistically difference uh, between the both arms. Uh, the follow-up was, uh, it was a very long follow-up, 28 months. Uh, so if you look at the side effect, uh, neutropenia occurred in 52 uh, in the ventricular arm um, versus 48, which is also not statistically different. The only statistically different side effect was a GI, <coughs> which happened 8% in the uh, ventricular arm versus 3.3 in the chlorambicil arm. <coughs> So uh, there is now more trend to use more targeted therapy together, like ibrutinib and vitoclax in high-risk and older patients with CLL. Uh, so uh, this is important study, actually looked at the combination of two agents. 
So the first uh, column does show you that uh, response to treatment uh, after three, cycle of three cycles of pretinib alone. <coughs> so the overall response was, was almost close from 100%. However, I mean, none of the patients actually achieved negative MRD. Uh, addition of venetoclax after three, uh, uh, addition of uh, venetoclax with a protinab after three cycles helped in achieving MRD uh, negativity in 17%. Uh, and the percentage of MRD negativity kept increasing with the, with the longer duration of combined medications. So uh, a protein plus uh, vetoclax uh, in a first line treatment uh, was tested in cap uh, Captivate study. So there were 164 uh, patients who were treatment naive, uh, less than age of 70 years, with an excellent performance status. Uh, the protocol started with the protein followed by uh, venetoclax, uh, and the dose was a ramp up uh, strategy and given for 12 cycles. And then, <coughs> then they compared that uh, undetectable MRD uh, versus those with, uh, so those with uh, undetectable MRD, they continued in a protein up. Those with undetectable MRD, they continued in a protein up plus venetoclax. Uh, <coughs> it's important that to, to, uh, to look at the risk of tumor lysis. Uh, using a protein at the upfront helped reducing the risk of tumor lysis as well as shrinking the lymph lymphadenopathies. Um, so this is the MRD. Uh, so uh, at, the, at the beginning, uh, so it was more than 1% in almost all in the preferred blood MRD in the first column was 93% that, uh, percent had an MRD positivity. However, the percentage uh, kept, kept getting less with the time uh, and, and until we reached 93 with negative MRD. So we'll just, uh, the last part of my talk will be a scenario. So this is uh, a 55 years old male who was, who presented with upper respiratory tract infection uh, and lymphocytosis. Uh, after, uh, after several months of follow-up, <coughs> lymphocytosis persists. Uh, he does have comorbidities of being COB COBD, obstructive sleep apnea, excellent performance status. So uh, after persistence of lymphocytosis, he underwent investigation, uh, including immunophenotype from the peripheral blood, which was consistent with CLL, CD19, CD5, CD20, 23, FMC7. Uh, physical exam uh, did not uh, reveal any massive uh, lymphadenopathies. So he was diagnosed as asymptomatic CLL. Um, he stayed uh, under observation or watch and wait approach for two years. However, he started to have a B symptoms uh, and increase, increasing, uh, increasing size of lymphadenopathies. Uh, and the patient also wants to be in treatment. So what should you do? More tests, start treatment, uh, watch and wait. Okay, start treatment. Uh, but I, I did not give you any important uh, information that we need before we start treatment. Yeah, so we need, we need more tests, okay? So we need to know IGHV, we need to know cytogenetics. Uh, <coughs> so, so in a patient who confirmed, so we, ha we have to do uh, 11Q, yes or no? Yes, so it's part of the IWCLL recommendation. Uh, if yes, when should you do the deletion 11Q? At, at diagnosis, before the treatment, uh, the first treatment or all the treatments? before you initiate all treatments. Okay. Uh, so uh, as we mentioned, uh, you have to test for deletion 17 and TB53 mutation. Answer is yes. Uh, and then uh, when, sh when, when should you test for these mutations? Before, before each line. After each line. Before you initi initiate all treatment. Uh, because it has a, uh, it, it has a, uh, it will change your pra practice actually. Uh, the treatment that you might offer the patient will depend on it. Uh, <coughs> so how do you do deletion 17 or TB53 mutation? Is it conventional, FISH, Sanger technique, and GS? Uh, 
Yeah, so f uh, fish, f uh, fish should be uh, should be enough actually to detect deletion 17 uh, or even TB53. <coughs> so IGHV is an important test that you, it's now part of the recommendation for any treatment for CLL patient. And before you, before you initiate a treatment, it has to be offered. So uh, the patient, that patient had a normal carry type. Uh, fish showed 13Q deletion. Uh, IGHV unmutated, uh, lymphadenopathies was small, WBC was 88, uh, with the absolute lymphocyte of 79. It does have anemia as well as uh, mild thrombocytopenia. So how would you treat this patient? FCR, BR, ibrutinib, chlorambicil. How old is this? 55 with uh, IGHV unmutated. Um, he is uh, with comorbidities, which in form of COBD. Uh, so if you look at the uh, uh, NCCN guidelines, so it, it has to be targeted therapy without a protein or, or vetoclax. Uh, other options are still, I mean, uh, using chemoimmunotherapy is a valid option, uh, but it, uh, it is, was put by in NCCN as second uh, category. So uh, in summary, uh, how do you handle CL CLL? So, fair <coughs> so first is you have to answer the question is, is the patient having an active disease, yes or no? So if no, we'll go on the watch and wait. Uh, if he's having an active disease, then we have to look at deletion 17 uh, and P53 mutation. If he's having these mutations, then you have to go for targeted therapy, whether it's a protein up, uh, uh, plus minus rituximab, or ventoclax uh, with ibnutuzumab. If these mutations are not there, then you have, to, you have to do for IGHV mutation. If it's unmutated, which is considered to be bad prognostic, it happened in around 50% of the patient, again, you have to use targeted therapy. If it's mutated, then this goes to our traditional C, uh, CLL management, which is will be assessing fitness. If he is fit, you can e use either targeted therapy, if CR, if he's younger uh, patient, or PR, if he's older adult. If he's unfit, again, you have to consider targeted therapy plus minus chlorambicil. And thank you. <laughs>